Milne has not been lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Uh, we are just moving right now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Duckdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Signing officer, given that yet again today uh, parts of the country are facing severe weather and a renewed risk of flooding, I think it's appropriate at the outset uh, to again thank all of those in our emergency services, not exclusively but particularly police and fire, utility companies, transport operators, our local authorities and of course individuals and businesses in local communities who are all working so hard to respond. I and other ministers will be updated on weather impacts throughout the course of the day and we'll be working to ensure that all appropriate actions are being taken. Uh, later today, I'll also have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Can I thank the First Minister for that response and send my best wishes to all those affected by the floods and indeed thank all the emergency services for the tireless work that they're doing to protect people and keep them safe. In her New Year message, the First Minister said that 2016 would be the year of ambition, and I couldn't agree more. It's why I kicked off this election year by setting out a plan to help young people realise their ambitions and aspirations. For many young Scots, owning their own home is a key ambition. But for thousands of people from my generation, it's just a pipe dream. Thousands are stuck in a cycle from which there is little escape. They rent to save a deposit for a first home, but rents are so high, people simply can't put enough money aside. It means they end up paying those higher rents for years with no realistic prospect of buying. So can the First Minister tell us what proportion of young people in Scotland today live in the private rented sector? First Minister. There's a significant proportion of young people, as there now is across all age groups, who rely on the private rented sector for their housing needs. That's why one of the uh, focuses of this government has been through a variety of measures and indeed legislation has been on making sure that we have a high quality and indeed affordable private rented sector. I know the importance of that very well from my own constituency experience where the quality of the private rented sector is just as important as the affordability of it. Uh, Kezia Dugdale will be aware of the plans uh, that the government has to introduce new measures uh, in terms of rent controls in rent pressured areas, which is absolutely vital to ensuring affordability. So I hope these are issues that we can work together on across the Chamber. In terms of the wider issue about the aspiration of young people uh, for home ownership, that is one I, uh, like everybody across the Chamber, understands and wants to support. That is why uh, this government, since the moment we were elected, uh, has focused on two things. Firstly, uh, trying to help people into home ownership. We've helped since we were elected 20,000 people into home ownership through our shared equity schemes and help to buy. Three quarters of the people we've helped are under the age of 35. But secondly, and arguably most importantly, what this government is doing is focusing on increasing housing supply. That's why I'm so proud that we've exceeded our target of 30,000 new affordable homes in this parliament. And we're now looking, of course, towards our ambition of 50,000 new affordable homes across the next parliament as well. Mr. Dale. I welcome the sincerity of much of that response, but it wasn't an answer to the question that I asked. Because in amongst all of that, the First Minister failed to face up to the reality of life for many people of my generation. Because in 1999, just 13% of people aged between 16 and 34 lived in private rented accommodation. Today that figure is 41%. That's a threefold increase. That's thousands of young people in Scotland paying high rents to private landlords rather than owning their own home. It's generation rent. What the First Minister's generation almost took for granted is now often too out of reach for people of my generation. And when Nicola Sturgeon was first elected to this parliament, almost half of those aged 16 to 34 owned their own home. Can the First Minister tell us what that figure is now today under the SNP government? First Minister. Well, what I said, I, I, I was trying to respond to Kezia uh, Dugdale's uh, first question uh, by uh, being serious about the scale of the challenge that is faced. Uh, there are more people across all 
uh, age groups uh, who are living in the private rented sector. Some people, not everybody, uh, and I'm not suggesting for a second it is everybody or even a majority, some people make a positive choice to rent rather than to buy houses. And that's why we should also focus on making sure that people have quality options. Now, in terms of home ownership, uh, the housing crisis is part of the overall financial and economic crisis we've Order, all lived, too much lived, that we've all lived through over recent years has posed real challenges in terms of home ownership but we've seen in recent times uh, increases in the number of first time buyers i think we've seen uh, a 4% increase over the last uh, quarter and a, a higher more significant increase over the past year so we see that again going in the right direction but this government has made a very deliberate choice to focus on what we consider to be the things that really matter in housing. Firstly, making sure that we've got uh, the right number of houses being provided. That's why the 30,000 target this Parliament has been so important. It is why the 50,000 target for the next Parliament is so important. And I have to say, I haven't heard Labour make any commitment whatsoever to housing supply in the next Parliament. But secondly, we're focusing on making sure that whatever tenure of housing people have, they have access to high quality houses. That's what my government will remain focused on. I notice uh, Ian Gray is sitting next to Kezia Dugdale. It was, of course, Ian Gray who said in an admirable moment of honesty uh, for the Labour Party that the problem for the last Labour administration was that they passed world-leading housing legislation. They just forgot to build the houses to make it uh, possible to be implemented. Kezia Dugdale. We moved from consensus to mudslinging in one question there, presiding officer. And once again... Order, Ms Dugdale. And once again, there is no answer Order. to the question... There is no answer to the question that I asked, so I will give the First Minister the answer. In 1999, 48% of Scots under 35 owned their own home. That stands at just 28% today. Is this the scale of the government's ambition, really, for just over a quarter of young Scots to have the security that comes from owning their own home? Because today it takes a young couple, both on an average wage, 10 years enough for a typical deposit to buy their first home. So, Labour would help young people get their first deposit by adding to their savings. We would encourage people to put money away if they can, and in return, we would help them get on that property ladder. Now, we know the First Minister can't bring herself to back this plan, but we also know that her proposals just don't meet the scale of the challenge. So what will she do to help people in Scotland buy their first home? First Minister. I've, uh, I've outlined a number of things, and I'll come back to the plans of, of this government. But Kezia Dugdale's right to mention the fact that there has been a challenge in terms of getting people into home ownership. There has been a recession. There has been a financial crisis that has contributed to a housing crisis. That's why the numbers that she cites are as they are. But what she chooses to ignore is the fact that in the last quarter we've seen an increase in first-time buyers. Over the last year we've seen an increase in first-time buyers of 16%. Uh, now, that's what I want to focus on, uh, helping more people into home ownership. That's why uh, we have our open market shared equity scheme, which incidentally gives first-time buyers much, much more help when it comes to buying a house than the proposal that Labour has put forward would do. It gives people up to, I think, 40% uh, percent of the, the cost of buying uh, a house uh, and helps them in that way. So we'll continue to focus on schemes like that to help people uh, with the aspiration to own their own home. But we will also, and this I notice is something that Kezia Dugdale uh, has chosen to uh, dodge around uh, so far in our discussion, so hopefully she'll address it in her final question to me. Housing supply is at the root of many of the issues we're talking about. I quoted Ian Gray earlier on. Let me give her uh, another uh, view of somebody uh, perhaps more current and topical in the Labour Party than even Ian Gray, the Shadow Chancellor, uh, John Macdonald. I don't know whether Kezia Dugdale is one of those in Labour who supports him or not, but we'll leave that to one side 
for today. This is what he said. We, as in Labour, inherited a housing crisis from the Tories, which we then exacerbated by not building houses. That is the issue. So that is why in this Parliament we have already exceeded our target of 30,000 new affordable homes and why we are determined, uh, if re-elected in May, that we will build 50,000 new affordable homes. Labour have made no commitment to supply whatsoever. And maybe, presiding officer, that is because we know in this election, Labour is not aspiring to be the government. They're fighting to hold on to second place. In all of that, presiding officer, the First Minister cannot escape the reality that home ownership amongst the young is at its lowest level since this place was delivered in 1999. Because young people in Scotland are getting a raw deal from this SNP government. They are bearing the brunt of an austerity agenda that this First Minister seems content to manage rather than to change. Young Scots are less likely to own their own home. Young Scots are less likely to own their own home. They're more likely to be stuck in private rented accommodation. They are hard-earned cash boosting the profits of private landlords rather than investing in their own future. We want to spend the money helping young people buy their first home. Nicola Sturgeon would rather spend the money giving airlines a tax cut. Isn't it the case? Isn't it the case? Isn't it the case? Isn't it the case that the First Minister is on the side of the big airlines while Scottish Labour is on the side of young families just trying to get on in life? First Minister. Of course, Presiding Officer. First Minister. Is not the first not even the second, but the third use of APD oh, money by the Labour Party. Let me remind Kezia Dugdale, let me remind Kezia Dugdale yet again of her own words from the 30th of October last year. Uh, we would scrap the APD measure, which we would then spend that money on education. So it was education, it then became tax credits, now it's housing. Not the behaviour, presiding officer, of a credible opposition, let alone a credible alternative government. But let's get back to the important issue for people uh, out there across the country of housing. I talked about uh, our support for over the years shared equity uh, and the help to buy scheme. Let me remind Kezia Dugdale of something else we've helped uh, done to help people, particularly first-time buyers. We've removed uh, stamp duty, now LBTT, on all property transactions under £145,000, helping people buying starter homes. So we will continue to help first-time buyers, but we'll do it in a sensible way, not in a way that won't give first-time buyers any help until they've saved for three years, uh, but also will just help to push up house prices. We'll do it in a sensible way. We'll also continue to make sure that private rented housing, we're seeing rising quality uh, and more affordability. And getting back to the point that Kezia Dugdale still after four questions, has not addressed is we'll focus on building more houses because it's by building more houses that you get the cost of houses down and you let more people get them. That's what we'll do. We've been successful over this parliament and we'll be even more so in the next one. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Ms. Thank Davidson. you, presiding officer, to ask the first minister when she will next meet the prime minister. First minister. Uh, no current plans. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I associate myself with the First Minister's comments regarding emergency and local authority workers? Because the flooding that we've seen across Britain these last few weeks have been devastating for thousands of families, and we know that it's continuing to affect people across Scotland. We need to know how they're going to be supported. On December the 29th, the UK Government announced an extra £50 million in immediate support for homes and businesses affected by flooding. Five million of that money was handed to the Scottish Government and it's entirely up to them how that money is spent. Yet, as my colleague Alex Ferguson said in the Chamber on Tuesday, he is still receiving phone calls from people in Newton-Stewart wondering why people in Cumbria are already receiving support while they are not. I know that other members will be receiving similar calls. Ministers have had this new money for over nearly a fortnight. Why are they dragging their feet? First Minister. Well, 
I mean, R Ruth Davidson raises an important issue, and I think she's right to do so, but I, I think she is unfair in her characterisation. Um, she will recall, as all members uh, across the chamber will recall, that the Deputy First Minister, when he announced the budget uh, just before we broke for the Christmas recess, announced an allocation of £4 million pounds to those local authority areas most affected by the flooding that had been caused by Storm Desmond in early December in order to help those local authorities uh, support flood hit local households and businesses. And that money uh, is uh, there to provide uh, flat rate grants of £1,500 to individuals, businesses or community groups who have been directly affected by flooding. Uh, John Swinney also said last week when he was visiting Ballot and I was uh, visiting the communities in Newton Stewart that we will uh, very shortly make an additional announcement about a, an additional allocation to deal specifically with the impact of Storm Frank and uh, what we have seen in the days after that. Now, uh, we are taking care and John Swinney is taking care to discuss with local authorities what the appropriate amount of that allocation uh, will be. So that's the action we're taking. I think it's right, it's proper, and it's focused on helping people who have been so hard hit. Of course, in addition to that, we have activated the Bellwin scheme, which gives local authorities the ability to apply for help dealing with the immediate impact of flooding. And we continue to invest, as uh, people expect us to do, uh, to make sure that local authorities are able to put into place uh, the appropriate flood protection and flood defence scheme. So we'll continue to remain focused, and I hope, as we do so, we have the support of people across the chamber. Ruth Davidson. I thank the presiding officer for that answer. However, the fo first minister, sorry, th but the four million pounds she talks about is a previous allocation. It has nothing to do with the subsequent five million pounds that I asked about. That people who are currently affected want to know how this government is going to spend and how it's going to help them. And I wait uh, for further details on that answer. The first minister says that she's getting on. Uh, with addressing the issues and she's matching support from across the UK. But just this week, we hear local authorities saying that they are, and I quote, bemused by claims that f future flood defences are being fully funded. Farmers and crofters who are bearing the brunt of these floods are still waiting on the support payments that they were promised months ago because of what the NFU calls the SNP government's lumbered approach. And we know that people are beginning to ask why it is that firms and families can't get the support here that they're getting elsewhere in the UK. And I'll give just one other example, if I may. Before Christmas, the UK government set up an emergency recovery fund in flood-affected regions that was designed to help restore soils, to rebuild tracks and to repair flood channels. Scottish farmers are now asking the Scottish government to mirror this scheme north of the border. Will the First Minister do so? First Minister. We will, we will take, as we have done, all appropriate action to help people uh, affected by flooding. Now, Ruth Davidson says we haven't yet announced the additional allocation. And she's right, we've been very open about that. And the reason for that is both a, a simple one and I hope an understandable one uh, to people. We're still dealing with an ongoing situation. I very much hope it is not the case that we will see communities affected by flooding again today, but it is entirely possible that we will do. So we need to make sure we take time to assess the full impact so that we know what an appropriate allocation of funding will be. It may be more than £5 million that we need to allocate in order to meet the impact that people are facing. But just as we did in response to Storm Desmond, we will take the appropriate action in response to Storm Frank and the flooding uh, that hit uh, in the days after that and the flooding that we uh, may well see in parts of the country today. Um, in terms of uh, Ruth Davidson's comment about flood protection, flood defences, we funded all uh, eligible schemes that have met the criteria in terms of flood defence uh, systems. There are, as a result of the uh, 14 flood risk management strategies that are in place across Scotland, schemes over uh, the remainder of this decade worth more than £200 million that are planned. And we have given a commitment, through the commitment we've given to local government, to guarantee them 26% uh, of our capital budget right through to the year 2020, the financial certainty that those schemes uh, can be funded. Uh, that's the action we're taking. It's responsible, it's right, and it will be proportionate to the scale of the impact uh, that people are dealing with. And I, uh, personally, and the ministers in my government who have uh, one or more responsibilities in this remain absolutely focused in doing everything we can and everything we need to do to help individuals, businesses and communities who've been so hard hit in recent weeks. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. 
Thank you. To ask the First Minister what impact the introduction of an upper band of the minimum wage for workers over 25 will have on pay inequality and in work poverty in Scotland. First Minister. A higher wage level for over 25s will clearly be of benefit to some uh, low paid workers. However, we have concerns about the UK Government's approach to pay uh, because it is not, as this week's Resolution Foundation report makes clear, a real living wage. Uh, the rise does not support young people under 25, one of the groups most affected by the recession, and the introduction of this new rate will not compensate workers for the annual £12 billion in reductions to welfare, uh, given that it will be introduced alongside a withdrawal of support through universal credit uh, and proposed tax credit cuts for families with more than two children. Uh, we want to encourage employers to develop fair work policies that can promote equality and tackle poverty. The real living wage, of course, is calculated according to the basic cost of living, and that is what the Scottish Government will continue to focus our efforts on. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I agree with much of that assessment. Combined with welfare changes, this measure won't uh, abolish in-work poverty, and by leaving younger workers further behind, it risks deepening their exploitation uh, by the most unscrupulous employers. The First Minister knows that the Greens welcome the fair work agenda, and we think it can be bolder. So far, it emphasises placing support for those employers who are willing, rather than a more robust approach for the employers that are less willing. Isn't it time now for the First Minister to consider ensuring that taxpayer-funded business support services will only be available to those employers who treat the upper 25-year band of the minimum wage as the min minimum for workers of all ages to make sure that we don't just have an all-carrot, no-stick approach, which may work for some employers, but not for the worst? First Minister. Well, Patrick Harvey had an exchange during the debate the other day with uh, John Swinney on this very issue, and I absolutely appreciate where Patrick Harvey is coming from in this. I want uh, our fair work agenda uh, to be real and meaningful, and it is that. You know, we are, I think, the only government uh, in the whole of the UK that has a, a cabinet-level minister uh, dedicated to promoting fair work. What we've tried to do through both the living wage accreditation scheme and through the business pledge and indeed through the Fair Work Convention is say to businesses that they should be employing fair work practices, not as some kind of favour to government, uh, not as something they feel they have to do, but as something that is beneficial to them and to the prosperity of their businesses, as well as beneficial to their employees. And that's the, the, the whole ethos that we're trying uh, to encourage. And that is bearing success. We are now uh, the, the part of the UK outside the southeast of England uh, with the, the highest percentage of people paid the real living wage. And we've seen numbers of accredited living wage employers rise considerably. We're also seeing a growing number of companies sign up to the business pledge. So we'll continue to uh, give that focus to all of that work. But of course, we'll continue to uh, consider and indeed to discuss with others who've got an interest in this, how we can accelerate progress. And I look forward uh, in the remainder of this and uh, in the next parliament uh, to discussing these things and to hearing uh, the ideas and suggestions of Patrick Harvey and his colleagues. Jack the First Minister will be aware that support for industries like retail, hospitality and the care sector to pay the real living wage will reap significant benefits for those employees, many of those um, of whom are under 25. So what action is the Scottish Government taking to specifically target those sectors to pay the real living wage? First Minister. Well, these sectors, and Jackie Bailey uh, is right about this, uh, there are a, a small number of sectors that employ large numbers of people uh, that we need to make most progress in if we're going to lift the overall numbers paid the living wage. We uh, relatively recently had a, a fair uh, work living wage summit uh, that Rosanna Cunningham and I uh, both attended, which was very focused on uh, retail and leisure and care uh, sectors. And we will uh, bring forward, as I said in the debate on Tuesday over the next uh, few months, uh, more uh, proposals of our own about how we extend payment of the living wage further. There's no doubt in my mind that if we get more and more people onto the living wage, we'll help to raise the quality of, of work, which is why it is so much in the interest of businesses and employers, but we'll also uh, go a great way to helping deal with the inequality and the poverty challenges that we face. So I hope this is a, an area that uh, whatever, notwithstanding uh, whatever disagreements we might have, we can find uh, areas to agree on. Margot Fraser. Uh, thank you. This week's research by the Resolution Foundation uh, states that 500,000 low-paid workers in Scotland will benefit 
from the new national living wage by 2020. The Resolution Foundation have said, and I quote, the welcome new national living wage will have a huge impact on low pay. So instead of being so carping about this policy, shouldn't the First Minister be more welcoming? First Minister. Well, I think if I can repeat to Murdo, Murdo Fraser, uh, the first line of my first answer to Patrick Harvey, a higher wage level for over 25s will clearly be of benefit to some low-paid workers. So nobody, nobody quibbles with that. But it doesn't go far enough. The real living wage, and lots of people uh, outside th this government, but lots of people have put a lot of work in over a long number of years to calculate what the real living wage should be. Um, and the real living wage is calculated very deliberately according to the basic cost of living. That's why I think the real living wage is the figure we should be aspiring to getting people paid. So that's what I'll continue to focus on. Um, anything that takes us in that direction, of course, is to be welcomed. But I won't limit myself to the paucity of ambition that characterises the Tory party on this issue. I'll continue to aim much higher than that. Question four, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the proposed referendum on EU membership. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has proactively engaged with the UK Government both at ministerial and official level to influence uh, both the form of the referendum and the UK Government's agenda for EU renegotiation in order to protect Scotland's interests. Prime Minister and I spoke about this issue at our meeting in December. Uh, the Scottish Government believes that EU membership is in the best interests of Scotland and we are concerned that the people of Scotland could be taken out of the European Union against our will. Uh, we've also sought and will continue to seek engagement on the UK's uh, renegotiation process, but to date uh, the UK Government has not yet provided us with sufficient detail or opportunity to meaningfully influence uh, these proposals, but we'll continue to make attempts to do so. Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her answer. How can we trust the Prime Minister on Europe when he cannot even get members of his own cabinet to agree with him? What can the First Minister and her government do to ensure that Scotland is not hauled out of Europe against its will? First Minister. Well, I'm not, I'm not surprised that the Prime Minister has been forced to allow a free vote amongst his cabinet colleagues in the referendum. The Tories have always been split from top to bottom on Europe and the referendum, uh, far from healing these splits, so far only seems to be making them worse. I I'm not even sure if the Scottish Tories have got a position on the EU referendum. I think it's a complete free-for-all uh, in the Scottish uh, Tories. No, ma no, uh, no idea how many uh, positions will be represented on those benches. Um, but that's for uh, the Tories to worry about. Uh, what I'm concerned about is this prospect of Scotland if it votes, and I take nothing for granted in any vote, but if Scotland was to vote to stay in the EU, but the vote across the UK was to lead to us being taken out, I think that would be a democratic outrage, um, and I think it is a cause of real concern. But I'll be campaigning, uh, speaking uh, for my own part, I'll be campaigning to seek to persuade people, not just in Scotland, but uh, I hope people across the UK choose to stay in the EU, because notwithstanding its imperfections, I think our interests are best served by being within. Question five, Sarah Boyack. Sarah Boyack. To ask the to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will conduct a review of flood defences in conjunction with local authorities in light of this winter's flooding incidents. First Minister. Well, as uh, I've already commented on uh, today, the scale of uh, the flooding that we've seen in recent days has been exceptional and the impact has been devastating for many, many people across the country. Uh, the response from our emergency services, volunteers, members of the public, the councils and others uh, working together to keep communities safe, minimise damage and disruption, that response has been heroic. But we all know there's a long recovery road ahead for some of the people most affected. Uh, a review of flood defences was conducted in 2007. In since 2008, the Scottish Government has made available funding of £42 million a year to 
to enable local authorities to invest in flood protection schemes. And as I've uh, just said to Ruth Davidson, we have 14 flood risk management strategies in place and a number of schemes that will be funded over the years to come. However, it is absolutely right that uh, when we've experienced flooding such as that we've seen in recent weeks, that we do consider carefully any lessons that can be learned from what has been an exceptional situation and consider what further mitigating actions uh, we can take for the future. And this government will certainly do that. Sarah Boyett. Thank you very much, First Minister. And if you are now committing to a review in the light of recent flood incidents, I would wholeheartedly welcome that. Uh, the response we've seen in our communities has been inspiring over the last few days. But communities, businesses and local authorities are clearly concerned about the huge costs they've already incurred in dealing with this public emergency. And if I can uh, follow up the First Minister's answers to Ruth Davison earlier, uh, the Deputy First Minister has encouraged councils to reduce business and council tax bills for those affected. So beyond the potential money from the Belwyn scheme and the £4 million already promised, can the First Minister clarify that the Scottish Government will fully fund all those local tax reductions? And given that the cost of flooding is estimated by SEPA to be a quarter of a billion pounds every year now, can we have a review to have a new look, a fresh look at the resilience for our infrastructure, our homes, our businesses, our farming communities for the future, given that with the financial pressures on local authorities, not all communities um, at risk of flooding will receive flood defences over the next five years. First Minister. Well, as I, I said in my initial answer, of course we need to make sure that we learn any lessons that need to be learned. It would be completely wrong to take any other approach. What I don't want us to do, though, uh, and I don't want us to do this because of the significant work that has been done to get us to the position of the 14 flood risk management strategies that are in place, is involve ourselves in another uh, long-running review. When there's work there, planned, uh, detailed, worked out that we need to get on with. You know, for example, uh, the community of Newton Stewart that I visited last week, there is a scheme planned as part of the uh, flood risk management strategy for the Solway that we need to get on with, not look again at a wide ranging review. So let's focus on that. Uh, in terms of the financial support, I, as I've said previously during this session, uh, we will take a decision uh, very soon about a further financial allocation to help councils with things like rates relief uh, and direct financial support to individuals and businesses that have been impacted. And we will, uh, as I've said repeatedly, uh, take whatever steps we need to take to make sure we are doing all that it is reasonable for us to do to help with those that have been so badly hit in recent days. Question six, George Adam. Thank you, to ask the First Minister how many children receive free school meals? First Minister. Well, almost exactly a year ago, I went back to uh, my old primary school in Dreghorn to launch the introduction of free school meals for all children in P1 to 3. Uh, that policy a year on is proving to be hugely successful. Uh, latest statistics show that over 129 uh, thousand pupils in P1 to 3 are benefiting from a free school meal and over 192,000 children and young people across primary, secondary and special schools in Scotland took one. First Minister. George Adam. Thank you for the promotion, President Officer. <laughs> I thank the First Minister for her answer. I'm pleased that this policy is proving such a success nationally, but disappointed that the take-up in Renfrewshire is lower than the national average. Can the First Minister advise what funding is providing to local authorities to enable more children to benefit from free school meals and what more can be done by local authorities like Labour-controlled Renfrewshire Council to promote further take-up? I'm sure your time will come, Mr Adam, First Minister. <laughs> Officer, I suspect you may just have sparked celebrations in Paisley at the news that their boy in Parliament has been promoted to the office of First Minister uh, today. Uh, the Government has fully funded the rollout of free school meals uh, for P1 to 3 with uh, £95.3 million of revenue and capital allocation for local authorities across 2014-15 and 15-16 uh, and we have allocated a further £53 million for 16-17 so that local authorities can continue to provide free school meals for all children in primaries 1 to 3. It is one of the, the many ways in which we are putting the tackling of inequality at the heart of our agenda, giving 
healthy, giving children a healthy, nutritious meal at school while saving parents around uh, £380 a year per child. Clearly, we want more children to benefit in every local authority and we'll continue to work with education authorities, schools and teachers to ensure continued promotion of take-up of school meals uh, so that all children can benefit. And all members across the chamber have a role to play in making sure that all children who are entitled take up the option of a free school meal. Thank you. That ends for questions. We're now moving to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. <coughs>